Good morning, everybody. We are live here from the birdhouse. It is Tuesday, the third or the twelfth of March, and I can't believe we're already midway through March, but here we are. And as we get further on in this month, you'll start to see more signs of birds nesting and beginning to get ready to mate for the season. So I thought today we'll talk about birdhouses and birds that are cavity nesters. And we will get started. As always, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing or hearing. The birds can be pretty chatty, especially when it's a nice sunny day out and the weather's mild. We've had some colder days. We've had some snow. So the birds were kind of quiet for a few days. Um, but today's a nice sunny day. And I heard some cardinals singing out there this morning, some tufted titmouse singing. So I'm curious what kind of things you are seeing and hearing out there in your yards, you can throw those in the comments. If you have any questions, you can throw those in there too, or just say hi. You can always say hi to us in there too. Um, so right now you might have some of these out. These are the roosting pockets that we're always talking about during those winter months. These are the things the birds will go inside to stay out of the elements like the snow and the rain and the wind. And you can keep these up year round. There's nothing wrong with them being out year round at all. You just might see less activity in there during the spring months. So it doesn't hurt once it does become warmer out to take them down. That being said, um, although these aren't usually for nesting, we have gotten some reports of birds nesting inside of them, especially wrens. Uh, we had a few customers last year mention that they did have wrens nesting in their roosting pockets. So I would suggest if you are going to take them down to just check inside and make sure that there's no sticks or anything like that inside that a wren has used or has started uh, building its nest with. So I'll show you what a wren nest looks like as we go on in the presentation. But um, I would check inside just to make sure there's no nesting material or anything in there because you never know. And although today I'm talking about mostly bird houses and nesting material and things like that, um, not all birds will nest in houses. And so some of our more common backyard birds don't nest in houses at all. They'll nest in trees and in shrubs. So there's things you can do to promote their nesting habits, but there's not anything you can really set out to get them to nest necessarily. Whereas, you know, if you put out a birdhouse, you'll probably get something in it like a, a wren, a chickadee, a sparrow, a sparrow, at least, even if the hole is big enough. Um, it can be harder to attract birds like cardinals or blue jays or goldfinches to nest in your backyard because there's not a specific house or way to do that. But some of the best ways you can get them to nest in your backyard are uh, making sure you've got bird friendly trees and shrubs, berry producing um, trees and shrubs are always helpful. And any kind of gardens that'll attract insects, because keep in mind, once these birds hatch, the adults feed them a lot of insect material. So you want to stay away from any kind of insecticides in your backyard, any kind of sprays. You don't want to spray your yard. Um, it's, that is going to be the way to make it most bird friendly. And especially if you want to do butterfly hummingbird gardening, things like that. Keep in mind that when you spray for insects, it kills the bugs you don't want. It also kills those bugs that you might want, such as butterflies and the native bees and things like that. So keeping your yard as natural as possible is the best way to attract these birds. And those birds will eat a lot of the bugs too. So they'll take care of the, the problem. You know, if you do have a problem, they will take care of a lot of that problem for you, which is really, really great. Um, so some birds that don't nest in houses, like I said, are going to be cardinals, blue jays, goldfinches, um, Baltimore orioles are another one, but they do all nest in backyards pretty commonly. So something to be out on the lookout for um, this spring are some of these birds nesting, even though they're not going to be in a house. Hummingbirds are another one too, although their nests are very, very small, so they can be hard to see. They tend to nest over uh, on, on branches that kind of overlook water <clears throat> usually. And there aren't hummingbird houses. We get customers sometimes asking about hummingbird houses. Um, hummingbirds aren't cavity nesters, but they will nest on little branches, usually forked branches, 
kind of like how this picture shows. So we have been experimenting with some different hummingbird nesting platforms available from different companies um, that mimic this nice forked branch and give the hummingbirds just the specs that they usually use when they're nesting. So a lot of those products are new or newer, so we don't have a lot of feedback yet about how well they work, but we're getting feedback um, or awaiting feedback, I guess is what I should say from customers. So we'll keep you posted about that. So one way that you can entice and encourage birds to nest in your backyard, besides keeping it as natural as possible, is to put out some nesting material, especially um, things that are made of all natural materials like this cotton nesting ball is very, very popular here at the store especially later on in the season, goldfinches love to make a nice fluffy nest using um, down from plants and silks from spiders, things like that to, to wrap it all together. And they will use this natural cotton nesting material and they will devour these <laughs> nesting balls, if you will. Now would be about the time that I'd recommend putting one up. I put one up a, a week or two ago and I haven't gotten much activity on it yet. Um, I had seen a sparrow with some nesting material in its bill, I don't know, two, three weeks ago. And so I thought, oh, it might be time to put out some, some, some more nesting material. Hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet, which doesn't surprise me too much, even with the weather being mild. Still a little early for them to start nesting. Um, but if you put out this nesting material, birds will come to it. If they don't build their nest with it exclusively, they will use it sometimes to line their nest. One thing to keep in mind is to not use dryer lint when you are putting out nesting material. That's something people have commonly done over the years. It's just not known if the detergents used in the um, in the laundry, if that can harm the birds anyway, in any way. So if you're using detergents, which most people are, um, I'm not sure about those those soap stones, if you use the soap stones to clean your clothes, I should look into that to see if that dryer lint might be okay. But any kind of detergents that you're using, if you're using detergents with your laundry, which most of us do, um, you might want to not put that out for the birds just in case it can harm them in any way. But one thing you might have in plentiful amounts is pet fur, and birds will absolutely use pet fur for their nesting material. Songbirds, in general don't have a very strong sense of smell so it's not like the smell of the fur whether it be from a dog a cat a rabbit um, it really won't deter the birds from using it at all for nesting material in fact some birds like the tufted titmouse are very very well known to use nesting material and tufted titmouse will even grab the fur right off of the animal if they're laying down or just kind of sunning themselves. They're notorious for actually landing on an animal and pulling their fur out, which is pretty funny. But you can absolutely put your pet, pet fur out after you've brushed your pet. One good way to provide that nesting material is by putting it into a suet feeder. If you've got a suet cage, you can stuff that full of uh, whatever material it is that you are using. So Putting out nesting material can help entice the birds to nest in your backyard. Now, one bird that has interesting nesting habits is going to be the brown-headed cowbird. So if you're putting out birdhouses or if you see that there's a nest somewhere in your yard and you're able to look at it, you might see something like this. If you look at um, the picture here of the nest on the right, you'll see that there's four eggs in it and one looks very, very different. The brown-headed cowbird is a nest parasite, which means that they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds. And so they'll lay their eggs. So this big brown egg here is the brown-headed cowbird egg. The, the bird whose nest this belongs to will incubate those eggs. They'll all hatch. The brown-headed cowbird chick will most of the time hatch first and will be larger than the other birds. So they tend to outcompete the actual bird species that is that the nest belongs to. And because of that, they have a better chance of survival than sometimes the other nestlings. Um, so the, the mother bird will raise the brown-headed cowbird as her own. So if you do open up your nesting box or if you're able to see the nest and you see something like this, that egg is from a brown-headed cowbird has uh, laid its egg in the nest of, um, of whatever bird it is you're looking at there. 
and they are a protected species. So, so just like every other migratory bird, they are protected. So you're not supposed to disturb their eggs or their nest. So do keep that in mind if you do happen upon a brown-headed cowbird egg in your nest. But I always like to mention that because it's something very strange if you happen upon it to see. When you're setting up your bird house, you want to keep in mind most birds like a house that's stable. So one that doesn't move around a lot, one that doesn't swing around a lot. So mounting it onto a pole is ideal. You can mount it on the side of a house. You can mount it on the side of a tree. The only issue with that is that it tends to leave the house more susceptible to predators getting inside of it. They can easily climb up that tree. They can usually climb up the side of a house or, or shed or anything like that. So keep that in mind when you're mounting your birdhouses that they tend to like it stable. So mounting it on a pole is ideal. And if you're having issues with predation with squirrels or raccoons, climbing up those poles and raiding the houses, you can always add a baffle to it to keep them out. So stable is always good. We have poles that'll stick right into the ground and screw into the back of the house, which are super simple. That's this picture in the middle here. Uh, the pole has holes in it. The screw goes right through the holes into the back of the house, and then you stick it right in the ground, and it's super, super simple. And that's how I mount the majority of my birdhouses are with this really simple, what's called a bluebird pole. And we have those here at the store for you to pick up. We just got more of them in actually. Um, so that is that is what most birds want, but there are some birds that don't mind a house that swings around in the wind. And these are wren houses typically. Um, and these are the easiest way if you're trying to attract a nesting bird. The most simple thing you can do is put up a hanging, swinging bird house, but because most species like something that's more secure. Um, you might not get something in it right away. That being said, wrens will nest in these, chickadees will nest in these, and if the hole is big enough, you might get sparrows in there, of course, as well in your in your hanging house. So when you're selecting a birdhouse, the thing that really differentiates one from the other is going to be the entrance of the, the hole size, the diameter of the entrance hole there. And they usually start off at about an inch or an inch and an eighth. And that is the perfect size for a wren. And the higher up they go, the, or I guess I should say the, the larger the size of the entrance hole on the house, the more species that are able to fit inside of it. So there are a lot of different types of cavity nesting species that we have, at least here in upstate New York. And I'll show you what those all are. And uh, each one has slightly different specs for its house, but the main thing you want to look at is the diameter of the entrance hole. And it's also very important to make sure that your house has some way to clean out the nest at the end of the season. So most bird houses you'll see have an entrance hole of anywhere between an inch to about three inches. And those larger hole sizes are going to be for the nesting birds of prey like screech owls and American kestrel. There are birdhouses that are much larger. Barred owls, for example, will nest in cavities and you can get barred owl houses. They are very, very large and they do have a larger entrance hole there. But um, in general, you're gonna find most birdhouses to keep them manageable um, are going to be anywhere, um, you know, in a fairly, small and manageable size with an entrance hole of an inch to three inches. So here are some of the different species that we have that will nest in cavities. The first is going to be the Eastern Bluebird and it's only a matter of time before the Eastern Bluebird starts nesting in houses. We've been getting reports of them checking out different cavities, going in and out of houses, and they are definitely getting ready. They are one of our earliest nesting songbirds. So they will be one of the first, it's really the Eastern Bluebirds and the Sparrows seem to start first. And they'll sometimes start as early as March, although it's usually April that they really start nesting. And they do like wide open areas. So if you've got a lot of woods or trees, you might not get Eastern Bluebirds. They do like open fields and things like that. So they can be hard for some people to attract. That being said, they are becoming more 
uh, more common. They were in declines for a long time, but now they're becoming more common. On Saturday, we'll be talking about Eastern bluebirds in depth as far as ways to attract them. So if you're interested in attracting bluebirds and you wanna learn more, we'll have a whole class just on bluebirds this Saturday. One of our, or actually our best-selling house as far as bluebirds go, actually even in the whole store, are, are the houses that look like this with the slot or the rectangular entrance. These are sparrow resistant bluebird houses. And usually they have a shallower nesting cavity than most bird houses and they have this rectangular opening. And apparently sparrows don't like to kind of squeeze down and inside the houses, they like a circular entrance hole that they can easily pop in and out of. But the bluebirds don't mind kind of squishing down to fit inside the house. So if you're trying to attract bluebirds and you don't want sparrows, I would highly suggest the sparrow resistant bluebird house. And out of all the bird houses I put out, the bluebirds seem to like this one the best for some reason. When I was cleaning out my nest boxes, um, all of the sparrow resistant styles like this had bluebird nests in them where all the other ones were full of tree swallows. So there's something about the, the sparrow resistant houses that it seems like that they just prefer um, anyway. But this is a sparrow resistant bluebird house, which is a really great way to attract bluebirds and can help keep those sparrows at bay. And this is what a bluebird nest looks like. This is a, a bluebird nest from one of my bird houses and it is in the sparrow resistant bluebird house. And you can see kind of here from the, from the photo that it does have a shallower nesting cavity. If you look, a lot of these sparrow resistant bluebird houses, not only are they shallow to begin with, but then they come with wooden blocks that go inside them to make that nesting cavity even more shallow. So even though the base of the house is down here where my cursor is, there's actually a block of wood that's in there as well to make the nesting cavity even more shallow. And so the sparrows don't, or the sparrows don't like that and the bluebirds don't mind it so much at all. So this is what the bluebird nest looks like. It's a lot of tall grasses and they lay bright blue eggs. And you can see there's, there were four eggs there in that bluebird house. There's a lot of different types of bluebird houses out there. Um, some have viewing windows that you can open up the side and you can look and there's, there's plexiglass there. So you can open up the nest, the nest box and look inside and see if there's eggs in there or nestlings and it doesn't bother the birds in any way. Um, we have some that are really decorative. So we have all kinds of different and fun birdhouses for bluebirds and for, for other birds as well. Now, if you are putting out bluebird houses in a field, uh, you might get more than just bluebirds. You might get tree swallows. This is what I tend to get mostly in my bluebird boxes. My background here is a tree swallow on one of my, my bird houses there. I've got lots of tree swallows around. And tree swallows are pretty cool though. They love the same type of habitat as bluebirds, wide open fields and meadows, and they will build a nest with a lot of feathers in it. So this is what your typical tree swallow nest looks like. And they're much more messy, I would say too, than, than the, the bluebirds are. They, uh, their, their, their houses can be full of debris and things like that. The nests that they've built inside houses can be full of debris. So they can be kind of um, messier than the bluebirds but they will start the nest by using a lot of grasses like the bluebirds do. And then they will use feathers to line it. So when you open up your birdhouse and if you see there's a lot of feathers in it, it's most likely going to be a tree swallow nest. And then there's the house sparrow. If you put out a birdhouse just about anywhere with an entrance hole that's an inch and a half or larger, you just might get yourself a house sparrow in that nest box. They are very, very common in backyards, both at feeders and coming to birdhouses in the spring. They can be polarizing for people because they are a non-native introduced species and uh, they aren't protected, whereas most birds are protected because they are migratory. Uh, the house sparrow is not, the house sparrow is not European starling, which we'll see later on. And the pigeons are not protected birds. Meaning if you've got house sparrows in your nest box or anywhere else for that matter, you can remove the birds, you can remove the nest, you can remove the eggs. Um, so they are, 
they are one of the only birds you can do that to. People tend to not like house sparrows here and there because um, they do compete for nesting cavities with bluebirds. So they, they are known to go in birdhouses, especially bluebird houses, and destroy the eggs, sometimes kill the nestlings. They do that, but so do other species too. I think the house sparrow sometimes gets a bad rap um, for it and gets blamed a lot for it when it's not always house sparrows because wrens are also well known to do that too. But that being said, if you have a house sparrow nest in your box and this is what they look like, they tend to be made with lots of a lot of different things, a lot of different grasses and feathers and debris, um, pieces of plastic sometimes like cellophane or plastic bags you can find in there, all kinds of interesting things the house sparrows will use to build their nest. Um, but this is this is what their eggs look like. Also, they are light brown and or they're, they're kind of light, a cream color with brown speckles. And um, they'll sometimes build their nests on top of other nests. So the nest boxes being used by sparrows can get um, kind of cluttered sometimes, but this is what their nest looks like. And you can remove it if you choose to with your nesting boxes. And then this is the other bird that is not protected because they are an introduced species. This is the European starling. They're a larger bird, so they're going to go into nest boxes that are more for woodpeckers or for screech owls. So you don't have to worry about them in your bluebird houses, but they will come to larger nesting boxes if you do put them out. And this is the starling nest. It is much more neater than the house sparrow nest. They use a lot of tall grasses, long grasses. Um, they have these really light light, light blue colored eggs, and their nests can be quite large. So if you do have a screech owl box, for example, and you open it up and you've got a nest in there like this, that's a starling nest. The woodpeckers don't build nests. The screech owls don't build nests like your traditional songbirds do. So if there's a nest inside your screech owl box, it is most likely going to be a, uh, a, a, a New European starling nest. Now, one of the easiest things, like I said, that you can put out as far as nest boxes go or anything for attracting birds to your backyard is going to be a run house because they'll nest in just about anything. As we get into April, we'll start getting the phone calls of all the interesting places that wrens are deciding to nest. Um, we've gotten calls saying that they've nesting, they're nesting in the mailbox or the the little box under the mailbox where the newspaper goes in. They nest in garages. They, they'll they nest in shoes that are left outside overnight. Um, we had somebody that had their clothing out to dry in a clothesline and the wren started nesting in the pockets of the clothing. So they'll nest in all kinds of fun and interesting spots. Um, so the best way to attract a wren is to put out a wren house, which has an opening of about an inch and an eighth is what you're looking for. The nice thing about wren houses is that the hole is too small for the house sparrows to go into. And that's the same with chickadee houses too. The house is, the hole size is too small for the sparrows to wedge inside. So if you want to attract some songbirds, but you don't want to worry about the whole sparrow thing, get yourself a wren or a chickadee box because that hole is too small for them, for the sparrows to go inside. So we do have different species of wrens that will readily nest in houses two of them being the Carolina wren and then the house wren. And wrens will start the nest building process in multiple locations. So the male will start building the nest in a few different spots. He'll perch in the area and start singing his song to attract a mate. The mate will come over, she'll check out all the different sites, and then she decides which one to continue the nest building process and she'll, which she will do. So, if you do open up your nest box or if you're looking inside your roosting box or roosting pocket and you see some sticks, a thin layer of sticks, a wren has started the nest building process there. Whether or not they'll continue it, not sure. You'll want to wait it out a little bit, um, but they will start the nest building process in different spots. So I've had nest boxes in the past where there's just a little layer of sticks in there. And that was from a wren that started the process and just didn't continue on. So if you find that little layer of sticks in there, that was from a wren. And um, 
they will start the nest building process usually in April, but right now the, the Carolina wrens are definitely singing. They're definitely chatty out there getting ready for the, for the spring season ahead. Chickadees are another common backyard bird that you can get to nest in houses. And like I mentioned, the size of the hole that they can squeeze into is small enough that sparrows can't fit inside. So that's a, a perk as well. And uh, they will sometimes also nest in hanging houses. This is a picture sent in by Chris who had them nesting in her rent house. And they will also use a lot of moss with their nest building. So this is a chickadee nest here. Lots of moss, very easy to identify. Tufted titmouse are also cavity nesters. You can get nest boxes for them. They will take a nest box with even a larger hole than a bluebird, but they'll nest in tree cavities as well. And that's the same with all of these cavity nesters. You can attract them with birdhouses, but then you also might get them just in your trees if you have any trees with hollow holes. So tough to tip mouse, another common backyard bird that will nest in cavities, nut hatches, same type of thing. Brown creeper, bring up brown creeper here and there. They camouflage super well as they are climbing up trees. And so that's what's usually mentioned when we're talking about the brown creeper. You can get them in your backyard and sometimes not even know it because they blend in so well with tree trunks, but they're also cavity nesters. So they'll nest usually in trees. I've never heard of them coming to any of our customers' um, birdhouses, but you never know. And then the woodpeckers are cavity nesters as well. They tend to do their own thing and will make their own nest site by pecking into the side of the trees and excavating a cavity. But they'll also come into birdhouses if, the, if they have an entrance hole large enough. And woodpecker houses and screech owl boxes alike both come with wood chips because they won't build a nest like songbirds do. So if you do get yourself a woodpecker house or a screech owl box, you want to make sure to put the wood chips put some wood chips in there on the bottom of it. And um, if it's a screech owl house, you can even put leaves in there or something like that to help um, attract them. But they don't build the nest, they'll just lay their eggs right inside. So usually once the, when the woodpecker is excavating the hole in the tree, there will be a lot of wood chips on the bottom of it. And they usually have to, to pull those wood chips out and throw them outside the nesting cavity, but some will stay inside and that's where they lay their eggs. They just set them right inside that nesting cavity. So you can get houses for woodpeckers or you might just have them nesting naturally in your yard in these tree cavities. Downy woodpecker, we've got the hairy woodpecker, red-bellied woodpecker, pileated woodpecker. These are gonna be your most common woodpeckers that you'll find nesting in your backyard or in your birdhouses. And if you do put up that woodpecker box, be on the lookout again for the European starling because they can fit inside there. And just like the sparrow, you can remove that European starling nest if you choose to. Some other cavity nesting birds that you probably won't get in your backyard, but you, you just might because I know uh, some of you do get these guys in your yard, especially if you've got kind of some wide open space um, surrounded by trees, you might get this bird. This is the great crested flycatcher. Um, they'll sometimes go into nest boxes as well. They would go into a woodpecker nesting box. That would be more of their size because they are a larger bird, uh, but they will also nest in hollow trees. Really, really cool species there. Screech owls are a pretty common bird actually that we do have around here. You can hear them calling at night. Their call sounds like a horse's whinny, but they'll also nest in hollow trees. They'll nest in large, large nesting boxes. And the key for screech owls is apparently they like to have three nesting cavities kind of close by. They'll have one to nest in. They have one to keep their food in. Um, so they do like to have multiple, multiple spots nearby when nesting that is ideal for them. So putting up a screech owl box in a spot where you might already have a hollow tree would be ideal for them. But we do get screech owls. We get quite a few reports of people who have had success with their screech owl boxes. And if you put up a screech owl box, especially if you're by open fields, you might get American kestrel in there as well. They are another cavity nesting bird. This is our cavity nesting falcon. So you can attract falcons as well to 
your backyard. And then if you're by any kind of water, you might be able to get wood ducks. Wood ducks will nest in cavities uh, by marshes, by ponds. So some people do have luck with wood ducks nesting, but you do need some water around. And uh, when it's time for the wood ducks to, to leave, when it's time for the young to leave, sometimes the parents will just kick them right out of the box and they are out into the wild. There are other ducks too that nest in cavities, our hooded meganser and buffleheads. They both nest in cavities also. These you probably won't have in your backyard unless you have a lot of open space, but you never know. These are some other cavity nesters. And while not all birds nest in cavities and uh, they won't all nest on structures, like I mentioned earlier, some will just nest in the trees and the shrubs and things. There are some that kind of do both. So there are some that will nest in trees They'll nest in shrubs. They might nest on top of your, your lamp posts or in your wreaths on your, your deck. Um, if you've got birds like that that are nesting, especially kind of close to a structure, you can sometimes attract them with nesting platforms. So these are open platforms that are that have an open front, I guess I should say, but then they also have some protection. They have a roof, they have some, some walls usually on the side. And these are for birds like robins. Sometimes these nesting platforms are called robin roosts. Uh, robins are a really good example of a bird you can attract with these. They don't nest in houses. They don't come to feeders really. They'll come to bird baths, um, but they can be, um, they can be attracted and encouraged to nest with a robin roost. And people will get these, especially if they've got a robin nesting somewhere they don't want them to. Maybe they're nesting right by their front door and uh, the robin is very persistent, which they are. You can sometimes put up one of these robin roosts further down, say on your deck, if you've got, if you've got the, the robin nesting right on your, your light right by your door. Putting up one of these robin roosts further on down the side of your house or on your deck can help encourage them to nest there and not in the spot you don't want them. Morning doves are another bird that will nest on these nesting platforms. And then you can sometimes attract barn swallow to the nesting platforms also. Barn swallows will usually build their own nests made out of mud and they will be on structures. If you do have a barn or a gazebo, you might be getting barn swallows coming to them uh, because they will build these little mud nests on the side or inside of the structures. You can attract them too. We do have these little kind of pre-built nest type of platforms that you can screw into the side of a building and that starts that cup structure that they'll nest in. But this is your typical barn swallow nest. And I just love this picture of the little nestlings. So I threw that in there. And then finally, you've got your cavity nesters that will nest in communities. And that's gonna be the purple martins. So purple martins will nest in these those big houses that have multiple chambers in them. So your typical purple martin house will have anywhere between eight and 24 cavities usually. And you, if you you're lucky enough to get purple martins and you've got some established, you can keep adding and adding and adding houses. They'll also nest in gourds. Um, the hanging gourds they'll nest in sometimes as well. They can be hard to attract. They, again, like open space like the bluebirds do. They like being by water if possible. So they can be hard to get established, especially because the houses that they'll nest in, the whole size is big enough for, again, those European starlings and sparrows. So if you're trying to attract purple martins and you're just starting, it can be kind of labor intensive because a lot of the time you might have to spend cleaning that house out of those European starling nests and the house sparrow nests. But that is another type of bird we have here that does nest in cavities. One of the best places to go locally in the upstate New York, western New York area to see purple martins is Montezuma, the, the wildlife refuge up at their nature center. They have multiple purple martin houses. They have a really big colony that comes back every year. So they're not back yet. This is another migratory bird that we do have in the area, but really, really cool to watch. So as far as nesting goes, now is the time to get your birdhouses ready. If you don't have your birdhouses yet, 
now's the perfect time to start selecting them. And also, if you do have existing birdhouses, if you haven't cleaned them out already, now is absolutely the time. Clean them out of the old nests and the debris. Uh, we actually just started carrying, and I should have brought them to show you. I'll show you on Saturday these wipes, almost just like the Clorox wipes. We've got wipes now that you can use to clean your feeders. And I was using those to clean out my birdhouses, especially the tree swallow ones that get kind of gross inside. And they it made it so, so easy to clean out my houses. I'll show you those on Saturday, but they're just called bird feeder, bird feeder wipes or something like that. Um, they make it so simple. We've got sprays and things that you can use to clean them out as well. Um, but then, you know, you've got your spray, then you've got to have your paper towels and everything. It was just so, so simple with these wipes. So I'll show you those on Saturday. Um, but now is absolutely the time to clean out your houses if you haven't already. And in order to do that, you want to make sure you do have a birdhouse that has a clean out. So when you're shopping for birdhouses, make sure that it has some door on it that will open up. Or sometimes it'll be um, a screw on the side of the house. You have to unscrew it to open up the side of the house to get into it. Whatever it is, just make sure it has some kind of a clean out and maintain the, the house the best you can. You can clean the houses out every time the young fledge. So some birds will have multiple broods every year. Bluebirds are a fine example of that. They'll have two to three broods a year here usually. You can clean those nests out as soon as those young leave, if you can catch them in time. That's the hard part. Um, sometimes the young, are out of the nest and already the birds right away start with their second brood. Um, so if you can catch it in time, you can absolutely clean those nest boxes out as soon as the birds are done with it. Otherwise you wanna make sure you clean them out at least once a year is ideal. So if you've got comments or questions, you can absolutely throw those in the comments here. Um, like I said, we'll be doing a class exclusively on bluebirds on Saturday because we are getting into bluebird time, which is very exciting. Um, Randy is on and says, good morning, Liz. Welcome back. Goldfinches are back and enjoying the Niger seeds. We get a lot of comments about goldfinches all the time saying, where are my goldfinches? I had flocks and flocks of them. I haven't seen them in months. And that's pretty typical with with the goldfinches they will be in one spot for a while and then they just kind of flock around to different areas they are here all winter um but they just kind of ebb and flow at people's feeders and in their backyards um jorge's on and gave a thumbs up bob says seeing a few pine siskins this past week they might or they mix right in with the goldfinches so it looks like the goldfinch feeders the Niger feeders uh, have been getting a lot of action, both with goldfinches and pine siskins, which is pretty cool. So Bob's been getting some pine siskins. So look for some stripy looking birds at your Niger feeders. Those are most likely going to be your pine siskins. Diane is on, says, thanks, Liz. Lots of good info. You are absolutely welcome. Uh, I should also mention too, here at the Birdhouse, we are organizing all kinds of events. It's our 30th anniversary here. We'll be celebrating that a lot next month with different events, including bringing in author Stan Tequila for a talk, actually exactly a month from today. He'll be giving a talk on April 12th about owls, which we're very excited about. Um, so he will be here that evening and then also the next morning giving a book signing here at the store. So not only do we have that going on, but we'll have a week long of events during, um, during our 30th anniversary celebration, as well as other things too that we have planned, including bird walks and things like that. So you can check out our event list at thebirdhouseny.com. And so we are adding more events every week to that list. We have a short list at the moment and it will be growing quite a bit as we go on in the month. So keep an eye out for that for the most up-to-date information. You can also see those events on Facebook as well. But we will be back on Saturday with another live stream. And this time it is all about bluebirds. So we will be back then. And until then, have a great week and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.